Well, welcome everybody to Avmetry Education Consultants National Webinar Series, uh, Sunday night edition. Tonight is OCT interpretation, vitreous and retina, enough pearls to make a necklace. And speaking tonight is my partner, Dr. Greg Caldwell, a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. He completed a one year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the Eye Institute, uh, as I did. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American Board of Optometry, and a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and a member of the Optometric Wellness and Nutritional Society. He currently works in Duncansville, PA, as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is the diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment ocular disease and has been a participant in multiple FDA clinical trials. He has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care and practices integrative optometry. He is a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook. He has lectured extensively throughout this nation and other nations. Uh, in 2010, he served as president of the POA, Pennsylvania Optometric Association, and served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2016. And he's president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, it's our great pleasure and privilege to hear and see Dr. Greg Caldwell. And yes, well, thanks, sure. Pitt Pittsburgh was cold mm -hmm. and high needy. How was Pittsburgh? Yeah, Pittsburgh was good. All right. Not cold as it could have been for February. We'll take it. All right, everyone. Thanks for being here. As Joe mentioned, Joe, thanks for that introduction. We're going to be doing OCT interpretation. We're going to kind of slow it down a little bit here tonight. I hope you guys like uh, what, what I did here. Um, I'm going to try and take a different direction, try to explain a little bit more, a little bit more anatomy, so on and so forth. So let's, you know, I hope this is this new lecture built for OEC based on a bunch of text messages that I get. People always sending me uh, uh, text messages to interpret you know, OCTs or emails to look at OCTs. And this is kind of where this one has kind of spawned from. Uh, here are my disclosures right here. Uh, anywhere from Alcon to Santan, re receiving speaker honorariums, advisory board, Allergan to Vices, um, you know, received honorarium for that. Uh, really no direct proprietary interest with any of the companies uh, that I'm mentioning here tonight or throughout uh, non-affiliated uh, affiliation with Pharmanex. Uh, Involve PA medical director uh, for Involve, which is a managed Medicaid in Pennsylvania. I do get an honoraria for that. Healthcare registry is no honoraria, but fun to be a part of that. It's an outcome-based registry, and I kind of help them with the diabetes and macular degeneration. Uh, the most important of these two, it was independently prepared by me and was not influenced by anything. And if I do mention any, you know, OCTs tonight, I'm not saying that there's uh, any uh, superiority. There's no commercial bias. Um, and I am, as Joe mentioned, we are half owners and there's all the conferences that we do live that are out there. So there's the disclosures. People always ask at the end what type of resources there are. So I'll get them out of the way here. Uh, this is OCT Connect, as Joe mentioned during my bio that uh, Julie Rodman and myself, we started this quite a few years ago now, probably four or five. I think the last time I checked, we have 9,000 people from all over the world, from Australia to Israel, to Europe, to the United States, South America, Africa. And it's basically just a nice, safe place. We wanted to do it for, for, for not fluorescein angiography, OCT angiography, uh, but it turned in just to be B-scan, OCT, a nice little community. So if you ever want to just go in, you'll have to be admitted. But you can scroll through, lots of people commenting on there, lots of experts in this arena. Um, you can just kind of scroll through a you know, half hour, an hour, a couple of times a week and probably pick up a lot of pearls on OCT there uh, without having to, to read a book. Um, if you don't want to read a book, uh, here's what I call a B-scan OCT. Um, anytime you see like Goldman, Wahid, and Duker, these are kind of the founders of OCT. Um, so there's, I have no financial interest. Julie Rodman, uh, did a, uh, OCT angiography. She might have financial interest, but I don't, uh, there is, uh, there's a nice book there on OCT angiography. Now, ocular coherence tomography, um, you know, it starts with this reference mirror. 
You need a beam splitter. You, I'm, I'm kidding, guys. I have no idea how the darn thing works. It's this cartoon right here is probably uh, the best. You know, then step two, it says here, can you can you be a little bit more detailed when it says, you know, then a miracle occurs. That's kind of how I look at an OCT. You know, it's all this fancy stuff, beam reducers. I just gotten pretty decent at, you know, kind of learning the retina anatomy that can be seen seeing what happens and learning how to interpret them. So with that being said, I just kind of want to know the audience here tonight and just see, you know, what do you have in your office? You know, you have OCT, OCT angiography, or really no OCT instrument currently. So just kind of want to know what's, uh, what, what we have here. And I'll scroll through here and I see some interesting kind of drinks that are out there. So that's kind of cool. Thanks for participating. All right. Everyone's pretty well warmed up. Look at that. 82%, 83, 84, getting up there quickly. See if another one goes by. All right. I'll end the poll and share the results. And there you go, everyone. We have 60%. It's I'll say still have OCT. Uh, we have about 18% that have OCT angiography, and it's great. We still have 22% uh, here tonight that want to learn a little bit more how to interpret these images. They don't have the don't have the instrument. So welcome everyone. Thanks for being here, and hopefully you like the 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 uh, uh, the webinar. So OCT, OCT, angiography, to me, both are becoming important in the diagnosis and management and treatment of disease. Um, I was going to make it a polling question, but I'll just kind of make it food for thought for you. When you think of, of diabetes, what type of condition is that or what, you know, what type of disease is it? And I'm going to answer it for you. It's a capillary disease, right? So diabetes is a capillary disease. That's why you get retinopathy. Uh, neuropathy, you get uh, uh, nephropathy, and there's kidneys, tons of capillaries in the kidneys, neuropathies, the capillaries start to shut down, um, and then top of it, retinopathy. So, I, you know, we as speakers always say the crime must fit the punishment. So to me, if we're going to follow someone with diabetes, I'm not going to really have too much tonight with diabetes, but we'll show some angiograms in some of the cases, but if we're going to follow someone, the crime must fit the punishment you can pick up that capillary dropout before you see the changes on the B scan. Uh, same thing with macular degeneration. Sometimes you can pick up those choroidal neovascular membranes that are out there. So if you're on the fence, um, you want to, you know, in a sense, you know, take your OCT and early diagnosis to the next level. Consider, you know, exploring and maybe at the next trade show, someone that has OCT angiography and see those benefits that are out there. I believe if I heard, if I remember. Harvey Richmond on our practice management just last Tuesday mentioned that there might be a code coming out for it next year, if that's maybe holding you back. But, you know, I, I find the value. I've been doing OCT and geography for since it's came out. And I think we've had it for seven or eight years now. And really, it's been a benefit. Ocular coherence tomography, you know, the time domain back in the Zeiss days. Um, the time domain, you had about 15 to 16 microns of res uh, resolution. Just remember, if you take a millimeter, you know, like a, you know, we all have millimeter rulers, so we all know how big a millimeter is when we check PDs. If you take and cut that a thousand times, that's a micron. So we're able to get down to uh, five to six microns of resolution. So I say to the patient, hey, look, you know, I'm able to see some pretty cool stuff with this instrument. If you take a slice of bologna and you say, hey, to the delicatessen person, you know, can you slice this a thousand more times? And just imagine how thin that would be if we could just take five or six of those slices. That's how small it can be. And then we're getting into swept source. And I've seen some pretty cool um, images coming out of swept source. They're really figuring out how to manage that, uh, that database uh, of how the big those, um, those images can be. And they're figuring out how to compress them. And so there's going to probably be some swept source coming out here in the future. So... With that being said, you know, this was the time domain images. You were getting about 15 to 16, say, thousand scans per second. And uh, with that, you got a pretty decent image and we were pretty excited. And then when they came out with spectral domain in about 2006, about four years later, that got up to about, <laughs> let's say, uh, 30 to 35,000 scans per second. 
So you got maybe two and a half times more scans per second. With that, you're able to get better resolution. You know, some of these instruments now they're talking, you know, 120,000 scans per second, 240, 500,000 scans per second. So when you get up there, you're starting to get to some really cool bottom, you know, because the eye's not moving. You're able to kind of capture that all in that second while the eye's in a sense still. And so you can get some really cool images. Now, in 2014 is when OCT angiography came out. And you needed to get to this resolution about 70,000 scans per second. So basically, again, to kind of recap, this is about 15,000 scans, say 30 to 35,000, double that. And then you're able to get the angiography that's out there. So it's all about the, just think about that, 1, 1,000, 70,000 scans, and they're able to then pick up what's moving and not moving and subtract it out and give us these nice images. So four basic categories of diseases that's out there. We have kind of this vitreo retinal interface neurosensory. That's where we're going to spend a lot of time tonight is in that area, just kind of taking a deep dive. You know, then we have the RPE area and the choroid. Um, with that being said, where are the blood vessels of this, of the, of, of the retina? And they're basically in the inner retina, which is, in this case, they're labeling it as the superficial plexus in the internal limiting membrane to the inner plexiform layer. And then the deep plexus is the inner nuclear layer to the outer plexiform layer. So basically, that's the inner retina. And then when you get to the outer retina, we're going to talk about this, I think, in the next slide. That's where your photoreceptors are. Your photoreceptors basically should not have any blood vessels in it. They're capturing the light and then processing it and then kind of going back forward again to out towards the eye, right? Going from uh, inner retina to outer retina to the ganglion cell to the optic nerve and then you know lateral geniculate back to the brain and so on and so forth. This area is black because there really shouldn't be any blood vessels. So it's really sandwiched between this inner and outer retina or this area here of blood vessels and then the choriocapillaris choroid. No really blood vessels in that outer retina uh, that's out there. So kind of keep that in mind. So with that, we kind of get these types of images. This is on top in the uh, inner retina and then the outer retina, you know, no blood vessels and then the choriocapillaris here. So, this is in the handout, and I really really put this in here a lot of times just for completeness, just to kind of remind everyone. But, you know, I've been doing a lot of, as Joe mentioned, doing a lot of functional medicine and going to some different classes and learning about mitochondria and, you know, avascular zones and vascular zones and so on and so forth. So what I really wanted to point out in this drawing here from this kind of, you know, I should kind of drew, drew this on my laptop, trying to go across here. Basically, from this uh, from this RPE complex, you know, up to the uh, ellipsoid zone here, the inner and outer segments, the myoid. Then we're talking about the uh, externally living membrane and the nuclear bodies. Basically, this is all the photoreceptors, right? We're going to talk about this uh, ellipsoid zone in a little bit more detail here in a few slides. But this is when you look at this. What I have between the yellow is basically the photoreceptor the cones, the rods, and so on and so forth. Um, this is the like the nuclear body of the photoreceptor here. That's what the outer nuclear layer is. And then it starts to create that outer plexiform layer where now we get into those, you know, amacrine cells and bipolar cells here in the inner uh, nuclear layer. And that's what I'm kind of show here with this kind of picture is this right here is the yellow area, the rods and the cones. And we're going to talk about this important line here, this ellipsoid zone. It's changed its name and why it's important. So right here in this box that I'm kind of going around in this picture is the box in yellow. And then when we talk about the amacrine cells and the horizontal cells and the bipolar cells, that's your nuclear layer here. These are the nuclear bodies in the inner retina that's what so just try to take this kind of if you want to say cartoon and put this here would be here these are the photoreceptors here 
All right, but then I drew this other yellow line in here. This, this other yellow line is the outer nuclear layer, okay, the nuclear layer right here, and then the plexiform layer right here. I'm sorry, right here, I'm sorry. I pointed to the wrong, this is the inner nuclear layer. Point, I'm pointing to the outer nuclear layer here and the uh, outer plexiform layer. The plexiform layer is in white. And what I want to point out is that where the photoreceptors are and the inner retina, there's a loose space. This is a loose space through here. This is all tightly packed down here. This is all photoreceptor here, tightly packed. So if you're going to see separation, this is typically where you get those lamellar, right, L layers, those lamellar separations. Um, you're going to get that between the inner and outer retina because there's a loose association from that photoreceptor to that inner retina, and that's basically where it is. With that being said, if we go back and we look to where the blood vessels are, if this is where diabetes is leaking, then it's going to kind of pull to that area of, of loose association. So when you look for like fluid in the eye, we're usually looking in this area of the outer nuclear layer and the outer plexiform layer. Just there's that kind of loose space that's in here. This is all tightly packed. But if these capillaries that are in this inner retina leak, it's just going to kind of trickle down. But then this is tightly packed here. So this is where the fluid will build up. But it's also loosely associated. So not able to build up fluid, it can separate if there's traction from that from that vitreous. And this is just another for completeness. Um, I share my full slides. I share the six slides per page. It's this one here is just nothing more in case you want to have something to reference when you're looking at your OCTs. The only thing I'm going to point out is I don't need to know if it's nasal or temporal. The nerve fiber layers, we're going into the nerve over here. The nerve fiber layer is always thicker uh, on that nasal side. So this is nasal uh, and this is temporal over here. All right. So when you do angiographies, you know, does age make a difference? Here's a 60-year-old person. Here's a 25. This was one of our students that were in the practice. And you can do you know, the radial peripapillary capillaries is what we're picking up here. This is the choroid. And then we can kind of see these different densities um, around the optic nerve. You know, when it comes to glaucoma, OCT angiography is good. When it comes to diabetes, it's awesome. And when it comes to macular degeneration, it's great. So, but it also can help us solve some cases as we'll show tonight. But what I want to point out is you see the, the red means it's blood flow. And you can see there's blood flow in this inner retina, but you can see there's really no blood flow in this outer retina. So the, the photoreceptors really need to, it's kind of like the, you know, like the, the cornea and it gets its, there are no blood vessels. It gets a lot of its nutrients from the aqueous. The photoreceptors get it from the inner retina and the choriocapillaris. There's really no blood flow, as you can see here, as we're picking up in this 25-year-old man. And here's around the, the macula. It's always thicker on the nasal side than the temporal side. This is percentage of capillaries to other tissue. And really, there's no change. This, it was, uh, this is the partner in my practice. And you can see his, uh, he's very healthy and still very healthy. The stage were taken a few years ago. And you can see that age does not really affect the capillaries around the optic nerve and doesn't affect the capillaries. It's, so it's the kind of the disease process rather than ages uh, that are out there. And you can see he has what's called a <clears throat> vitreomacular adhesion. Remember this picture here? We're going to be talking about that as we come up here uh, in a few other uh, slides. And it's just kind of cool what you can do. This is just montage. You can see it, it stitched these two together um, and you can see what's happening. And sometimes when you montage these, you can solve a few uh, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, conditions that are out there. So, you know, angiography is, is pretty, pretty cool. All right, I'm going to launch this polling question here. And really, I want to know, is the macula the orange? or is it the blue? Which one is the macula? So is it the orange 
or is it the blue? Orange or blue? So like it's like an optometrist, which is better? One, orange, or is it two, blue? So which is the macula here? I don't see any questions rolling in other than how was Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh was successful. We had lots of vendors, lots of attendees. See orange. Someone's re saying orange. And blue. All right. Let's stop there. And we got a pretty good amount of people weighing in here. If you maybe not sure what's going on, and you'll see here that, you know, if I was phoning a friend, um, I would you know, say blue. And this is the macula right there. It's this big. The macula is big. Um, and that's why, you know, and, you know, lean back to some of my functional stuff that I talk about. You know, the lutein and zeaxanthin, they're basically foveal pigments. They do kind of spread out a little bit into the macula, a little bit. So when it comes to treating like macular or retinal disease, Remember, lutein and zeaxanthin, they're really only found in the macula of the, of the or really the fovea of the, of, the, of the retina. So that's why you hear me talking about a comprehensive kind of antioxidant therapy out there. So, you know, during evolution, you know, the lutein and zeaxanthin really wasn't put there to really prevent macular degeneration. It does have its benefits. But if you think about the macula or the fovea, it's really the third lens of the eye. The cornea is curved, the crystalline lens is curved, we have another curve to the fovea, and we put a little bit of no glare in there and a little anti-glare to help cut back on that blue light to help us see a little bit better. And then it's there as a sunscreen to protect those cones uh, that's out there. So again, the macula is big, okay? That's what I want to point out tonight is the macula is big, and uh, that's why we take this education to kind of help us remind us. I'm gonna to get to this third poll here and I'll be ready for it whenever it comes. All right, so what is this layer, layer called right here? You don't have to put anything in the chat box. I've kind of said it. Here's your RPE. This is the, what is now called the ellipsoid zone. It was, people still call it the photoreceptor integrity line. Um, it's, you know, it's the inner and outer segments. But if you remember what I just pointed out, there's the external, this is the nuclear bodies of the photoreceptor. So really from here all the way down. So what is this hyperfluorescent area? Uh, we call it the ellipsoid zone. And when you study the ellipsoid zone, it is basically hyperfluorescing because it's mainly formed by the mitochondria within this layer uh, of the outer portion and inner segments of the photoreceptor. So again, from here, this is the nuclear bodies of the photoreceptors we showed earlier, the external limiting membrane, the myoid zone of the photoreceptor, which has like the endoplasmic reticulum, if you remember the cells, and uh, the, 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 the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, and then the, the lifeline or the mitochondria. So I'm hoping that maybe we'll just call it the Caldwell line someday, since we're just kind of pointing it out. It's the, the mitochondria. And that's important, right? That's important when it comes to the photoreceptor being vital, being, uh, uh, being able to work, right? So if the mitochondria are under oxidative stress, which we're not going to talk about that too much tonight, that'd be a macular degeneration. But we're going to see some conditions tonight where this this mitochondria line starts to drop out. And if the mitochondria are dead and there's nothing to fuel that photoreceptor, we don't have really the best visual acuity because the power plants are gone. But what I want to point out is this whole thing, this whole picture right here is the macula, right? So when we look at this from this scan over to here to this scan right here, and remember, those foveal pigments are right in here, lutein and zeaxanthin. I'm not a lutein and zeaxanthin hater. Um, I certainly believe in all the studies that were done, we just kind of have to get to a little bit higher, uh, more comprehensive uh, oxidative therapy. 
I kind of saw this, let's talk about OCT Connect. Someone put this on here and I really geeked out the one night um, when I was looking at this, when someone put on here, the interpretation of OCT and OCTA images from the histological approach. You can see I have it referenced here. This image was in this article. And what I really geeked out about is when we were looking at the uh, RPE level here, uh, when I said, wow, what's this pink? Let me see the pink, pink, pink. And I found it right here, mitochondria of the RPE. So the mitochondria of the RPE, and if you remember macular degeneration is this kind of complement factor issue that's down here. It's an outer retina disease. And it also stresses those photoreceptors that are here. That So again, you know, when we went to school, Joe and I had you know, Dr. Lombardi as, you know, as our anatomy teacher. And she always said, you know, it's always about the anatomy. And, you know, to this day, I'm still, you know, you know still believing her. Uh, and she's, you know, and she's 100% correct. If you kind of know the anatomy and what's happening there, you can solve a lot of these conditions and then help with your management of these patients. So this was a pretty cool little slide. And the reason why I kind of focus on these mitochondria is, you know, you heard Joe mention, I was just, uh, you know, getting into in integrative or functional medicine. You know, I'm not, I'm not alternative saying we don't need the anti-VEGF and we don't need antibiotics and steroids. But what that means to be complementary is to take some of these natural things like amniotic membranes and hypochlorous acid, tea tree oil, um, vitamins and, and supplements and, uh, EPA, DHA, which is our fatty acids. There's really nothing allopathic about those. Those are all natural. And uh, when I was walking through, you know, there's multiple places where they talked about the mitochondria is uh, health is key to healthy aging, you know, mitochondria, the importance of power and density. And when we come back and we can see literally the mitochondria of the photoreceptor, we really can't see the mitochondria of the RPE, but we know where they are, you know? And so the mitochondria of these conditions are super, super important of the RPE and of the photoreceptors that are out there. So some fun facts I've learned about the mitochondria. Uh, mitochondria produce energy. I think we all remember that. Uh, uh, they live about 100 days. They produce 90% of the energy, but here's the kicker. They produce 90% of the energy, but they produce 90% of the free radicals that are out there, right? And we're supposed to neutralize those with the whole fruits and vegetable type of thing. Uh, they become uh, dysfunction when uh, uh, and create many clinical consequences. What I want to jump down to here is a brain cell has one to two million in a single neuron. The heart has about 500 per cell. The liver has about a thousand. But when I dove down into the anatomy of the photoreceptor, there's about 500 per cell. So each photoreceptor has 500 mitochondria. And then the RPE has 700 that's out there. And again, you know, have some references about, you know, uh, the maintenance, maintaining mitochondria in the cellular architecture. So again, it's important when we're looking at these photographs and we're looking for oxidative stress or death, and hopefully I will point that out tonight, um, as we go through, and then the RPE complex where those mitochondria are, which are again super important to uh, healthy tissue and to you know aging gracefully. So, kind of to start the the lecture off and then get into some of the the anatomy here, we kind of review the anatomy and now some of the cases. I just want to ask this question here: Which structure in the eye changes the most with age? Is it the cornea? Is it the vitreous? Is it the retina? Is it the optic nerve? Which one changes the most? Which one causes us grief all day long, pretty much every day when we're in clinic? Looks like things are pretty quiet. Looks like Joe has launched the... Uh, Yes, the uh, yes, I have. We're good. We are Seven, quiet. 729. All right. All right. We got a pretty good roll in of answers here. 
share the results and cornea we have 34 percent saying the retina and optic nerve so i agree the cornea and optic nerve are probably the least you know it all depends you know like i would go with you know i'm not sure if there's any scientific literature out here but what i wanted to create was you know that vitreous you know it, it creates pvds it creates flashes and floaters it changes it creates you know all we really need in my opinion is we need it to come through the birth canal once we come through the birth canal all it does is create problems for us as eye docs we got to constantly <laughs> dilate and look for retinal holes and tears and creates pvds and later in life people get crazy with the floaters and it drives our patients crazy and maybe as a side effect that's why 34 percent say the retina changes but you know, the retina should be pretty stable throughout. The optic nerve should be pretty stable. The cornea, it's going to change a little bit. So the answer I was going through was, was vitreous here you know, with 57% of the audience you know, went with. So with that being said, we're going to talk a lot tonight with OCT of the vitreoretinal interface and the disorders. Again, I wanted to really kind of slow it down, take a deep dive because once a week, you know, I get people texting images and it's usually some type of, or, you know, is this glaucoma changing? Is this glaucoma progressing? And it's kind of hard because I've learned to take a deeper dive into seeing was their macular traction and the macular traction released? Um, was their optic nerve head PVD? And all of a sudden, there was a sudden change of the nerve fiber layer around the optic nerve, and that's because of the release of the traction. So it's hard for me to kind of, in a sense, to see some of these things sometimes, and we have to hop on a call where we talk and have them dig in. So we're just going to kind of focus tonight on this kind of vitro-retinal interface disorders. There's a few other cases I threw in there. I thought they were kind of cool, but kind of focus in that arena. So when it comes to OCT of the vitreoretinal interface disorders, there's epiretinal membranes, there's vitreomacular adhesions. And pretty much when we're born, we have a 100% vitreomacular adhesion. Basically, the vitreous is laid right across that, say, that internal uh, limiting membrane of the retina. And then what I were able to see as we age, as I showed it that, that with my partner there in the practice with that, my six-year-old angiography, you saw that lift up. So that's, you know, in a sense, a vitreo macular adhesion that we're able to see on an OCT because it's starting to lift. But there really wasn't any changes to the retina, and that's why it's a vitreo macular adhesion. We're basically able to see them as they age because of the OCT. Then we have vitreomacular traction, which we'll show some examples tonight of the traction. That's the, basically a vitreomacular adhesion taken to the next level where the, the architecture of the retina is changing. And then a pseudo hole is kind of that foveal cup, that foveal pit, where basically the cells that are proliferating get into that cup and then they form a scar tissue and then they can contract and that cup can just take on, you know, it's because it's kind of lining that foveal pit with like a glue or a plastic type. And then it kind of shrinks and hardens and starts to contract on itself. And that's why it can distort that foveal pit. Exactly. And we'll talk about lamellar holes and some uh, full thickness macular holes. So we're just going to start off here uh, with Wanda. These are some of the new cases. If you heard me talk about um, uh, OCTs before. There's going to be a lot of new stuff here tonight. Um, just recently went down Friday and pulled some stuff off of my, wrote some names down and uh, pulled some uh, pulled some images off. So Wanda, 66-year-old woman, she has diabetes. She wants, she needs a report sent to her primary care doc or endocrinologist. Looks like she's had a liver transplant, so we had to send a letter off to the... So she's basically in for a diabetic exam, right? She's in for a diabetic exam, needs a report going to the PCP endocrinologist and liver, and liver uh, transplant. She's best corrected to 2020 in both eyes, and she has you know, some small cataract, you know, trace to grade one, still able to see 2020. So I'm not going to really dive into what meds she's on and so on and so forth, the standard meds that are out there for diabetes, so on and so forth. It's an OCT lecture, so let's take a look at the OCTs. 
So here she is in April 13th, 2021. And you can see I'm using a raster scan here. You can kind of see where I am right below the optic nerve in that macula area. Remember, the macula is a nice big area. This whole area is the macula that we're looking at. Got the foveal pit. This one looks nice. But this one here, is there something going on like right here in this area? So we kind of have to kind of scroll through. And as we scroll through to the next kind of kind of moving shoe period, as you see here, I'll go back. We're kind of inferior here. We're going to kind of move up this direction as we go through these scans. And we start to see this little area here. You know, is it is it mac is macular edema? You know, is it uh, is it something else? Now, what we can't see, and I'm kind of bummed whenever I save these images, that there was a little bit of vitreous coming down that you could see here pulling on this, but I lost it in the in the in the, in the saving of the image. So here we are going uh, through the different scans. Um, again, depending on where you are, now we're a little bit further up into the macula. We have this little area here. We have this area here. And then we start to see some more separation and, you know, areas that are here. And then this is the left eye, the left eye, all left eye. This is just another scan using a different type of technology, one of the, the retina map. And then we could see here again, I'm kind of bummed. So trust me that there's a little bit of vitreous coming down and tugging on this. So I guess I could draw it in maybe sometime, but there's some vitriol traction here. You could see maybe a little bit of fading of the of those photoreceptors there for maybe the traction. No real. Uh, uh, remember, I remember I told you before when we mentioned. See that loose association. It's between that outer nuclear layer and that plexiform layer. So if you're gonna get fluid or some type of separation for some traction. And that's what's happening here. There's some vitriol traction on this. Where this is kind of a vitreous lecture, but this patient is a patient with diabetes. Um, I'm not really seeing any other fluid or any type of exudate. Uh, the angiogram was done on this. There really wasn't any leaking uh, that's out there. So with that being said, and we'll call that a vitreo macular traction, the question is, do you observe this? Uh, let's see, there's another poll. Did you do that, Joe? It's giving me an error message. Oh, it's launched. Okay. So observe, monitor, refer, other. You know, other would be, if you know, something else, you know, you put it in the chat box if I couldn't think. So basically, think of your what you would plan to do with this. Observe, monitor, refer to retina. All right, I see Sharon, I see you can't uh, find the polls or something. Maybe it got slid off to the side. Um, that's okay, you can answer through the chat box, that's fine. It's a little quirky tonight, Greg. Uh, one of the polls you had launched, I couldn't actually see it. Huh. Um, we got a good uh, good participation so far. I'm going to show the results. So we got uh, about 70% of the people saying observe, and we have about 30% of the people saying refer. And certainly you can never go wrong with referring. Um, this is something that I would probably sit on as a vitreomacular macular traction. That's, that would be the diagnosis that was there, uh, vitreomacular traction. And so I just said to the patient, I said, look, you have vitreomacular macular traction. Um, I don't think if I sent you to the retinologist, they would do anything at this point. I used to work with retina. I tell the patients I got comfortable with retina. Um, I'm really not seeing anything in a sense, diabetes, your right eye is clear. I looked at the angiography, nothing really like looking like it's diabetic macular edema, just more traction. I said, but you know, there's nothing wrong than close observation. So I said to the patient, let's just follow you back in about two months. 
and the patient comes back in two months and we'll kind of click through uh, these through these different um, images here. And we can see in two months time that the traction released and went back to normal. So yeah, we just followed this patient, left eye, kind of clicking through. I could click through a whole bunch of the other scans. But if you look right here on this retina map, we're kind of hitting right through the foveal pit. Left eye, I'll go back to these ones right here. This is where that traction was, these two lines right through here. You could see the this would be a retinal schesis, right? Or a macula schesis, a macula schesis, a separation of that inner retina from that outer retina. There's basically your photoreceptors, right? There are the mitochondria, the photoreceptors, the nu the outer nuclear body of the photoreceptor moving now into that inner plexiform layer or outer plexiform layer, sorry, outer plexiform layer. And remember that the whole idea is tonight to kind of slow it down and remember, that's that loose association and that traction from above is just separating that out. And you can see what's happened here. But the photoreceptors are you know, pretty well intact. And if you remember, I was able to refract this patient to 2020 and despite a small cataract. Now, what I usually tell my opticians whenever I go out, if they're getting a new pair of glasses, I'll say, look, if they come in, they read 2020, but they might see a little bit better quality out of that right eye because look what they've lost here remember as i mentioned that foveal pit is kind of the third lens of the eye it's really a you know concave for a reason and we put some of that no glare called lutein and zeaxanthin in there for a reason to really protect these cones that are in the photoreceptor or in the uh, foveal pit um the, that's what's in the fovea or the cones kind of put that sunscreen there and cut back on some of that glare. So I say to the optician, say, look, they've got a vitreo macular traction over here. They've got a little loss of their foveal pit. So if they come in and they're saying, hey, look, I got a difference between the eyes, that's the reason why. But the really cool thing with this case was we sat on it and you can see things went back to normal. That traction released and the anatomy went back to normal. So that was a pretty cool one to follow. So what are epiretinal membranes? Where do they come from? And again, it goes back to this crazy vitreous, right? That really is only needed in a sense to get through the birth canal, in my opinion. And Joe, please weigh in if you feel that there's any other benefit that's out there, but coming through the birth canal to protect the eye. And then from there on forward, to me, it just creates issues for us all the way, you know, to the patient you know, is 90 years old creating epiretinal membranes or floaters or flashes and floaters that we have to dilate on a routine basis. So where does it come from is that you, for in order to form an epiretinal membrane, you need to have a PVD, a posterior vitreal detachment. And the posterior vitreal detachment, what it does is it creates a crack in the internal limiting membrane. And then there are cells, right? We went through that anatomy a little bit earlier where there's amacrin cells and Mueller cells and astrocytes and all kinds of cellular material in that, mm -hmm. let's say that inner retina. And when you crack the internal limiting membrane, the cells leak out and then those cells can proliferate. So basically an epiretinal membrane is nothing more than cells that used to be trapped inside the neurosensory retina, and now they have proliferated uh, uh, to that ocular surface. And that's why a retinologist, you know, when it starts to create problems, um, they won't peel that membrane super, super early because it's kind of like jello. It's not mature. It's, you know, you take jello. And you put it in the in the refrigerator and it's been in there, say, 15 minutes. Yeah, it starts to harden, but it's still you can't cut it yet. It kind of falls back. But if you let it settle for a little bit, it will mature. And it's easier for that retinologist to go in and peel the membrane. Right. Mm -hmm. So but the problem is, as that membrane matures, it creates traction on itself. And that's kind of the puckering part. But then the other issue is, did it attach itself to that posterior surface of the vitreous? 
And that's why these things take on so many different uh, looks is because sometimes the posterior vitreal attachment pulls away and it's far away. It creates the crack, creates the epiretinal membrane across the surface. It's too far away to attach to that posterior vitreous. And so you kind of just get an epiretinal membrane that maybe contracts on itself and creates that kind of a surface pucker. But sometimes you get a, a, a PVD somewhere else, but it cracks the internal limiting membrane and the cells kind of migrate to that foveal pit and then that macular area, but then that slides right in under where the posterior vitreous is it starts to attach itself to the posterior vitreous. And it's attached itself to the uh, retina surface. It starts to contract. The vitreous pulls away. Now you have vitreo macular traction. So that's why, you know, they're so complicated. And it all depends on where that posterior vitreous is and where the PVD and the crack and all that is. So an epiretinal membrane, I didn't read this to you, but basically it comes from cells that are in that inner retina. You know, great, uh, inter great. Yeah, interestingly, there, there, are some, there are some papers out that have also identified uh, remarkably RPE cells in uh, epiretinal membrane, yet nobody has had an adequate explanation as to how RPE cells get there. Yeah, um, which then kind of takes me to the next level, Joe, of when you have someone that has retinal tear, and they have proliferative vitreal retinopathy, uh, not, not proliferative diabetic, not PDR, but PVR. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what they have found is, and that's, that's, you know, we're not sure how they got there, Joe. You're right, in an epiretinal membrane. In a, in a horseshoe tear of the retina, now you have the neurosensory retina torn. And that's where the fluid gets in and it creates that regenomatogenous retinal attachment. RPE cells can migrate into the vitreous. And that's, the, that's what drives retinologists crazy. They, they have a horseshoe tear, a macular on or macular off detachment. They put that buckle on, mm -hmm. they get the, that retina flat. And then about a month later, they get that kind of star tractional. That's proliferative, proliferative vitreo retinopathy. And there's a ton of RPE cells in there. So that was good that you brought that up to kind of separate out to the audience. Proliferative vitreo retinopathy, not PDR, but PVR. And that's mainly RPE cells that are in the mm -hmm. vitreous proliferating. So yeah, that's kind of cool. You are right. There you are. That, we're not sure how these few cells kind of make it up through there, but you know, it, they, they, they have histologically been found. Any other comments? I think we're clean. Yeah. All right. So epiretinal membranes. You know, you can see this one here. This is a nice little epiretinal membrane. This is over here, the nasal side, right? Because it gets thicker. I don't need it to be labeled nasal and temporal, but you can tell that this is right where the optic nerve is. And this epiretinal membrane is contracting. We're losing that foveal pit. We're getting some separation. See where the separation is out there? If you remember that separation, that the photoreceptors, they need to remain intact, right? They need to remain intact. Then you have all the amacrine cells and the bipolar cells, and there's that loose association between the nuclear layer, the outer nuclear layer, and the plexiform layer. And that's why you're kind of getting this little cystic spaces because of the you know, those tractional forces of that epiretinal membrane. So this is one that I would just follow. The RPE is intact. You could see the, 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 the mitochondria are intact and the rest of the photoreceptor layers. So this person should have a pretty good acuity. Now, this is the right eye. They might notice, even despite being 2020, because Snell and acuity, the contrast sensitivity would be different. And I do have ways to test contrast in the office now. The contrast would be different, but the Snell and acuity be 2020. And this is what you're kind of seeing with this on FOSS technology. This is just another way, EN face, EN face on FOSS technology. Um, and you could see here that this is where it's kind of contracting, but look at the, look what it's doing here as it go across. It's just kind of pulling on that 
foveal pit making it kind of pop up out. And you could see just so the, with these onfos technologies, what we can see, and you can just, this is, I love showing the patient uh, what's going on because it makes a lot of sense to them with these epiretinal membranes. But again, you're going to hear me hammer this vitreous all night long, you know, for another, you know, 40 minutes or so, we're going to be picking on this vitreous. So here's the onfos. Again, EN face, on FOSS, OCT image. Here's the optic nerve. I love showing these to the patients because sometimes we just kind of get that cut like right here. We're only able to see this, but really it's usually a big cellophane. That's why they call it cellophane maculopathy, big old scar tissue and all those glia cells that we talked about. And you can see right here how big this is. And right here is the culprit, right? This is a big black spot on the OCT, this is a PVD. This is the PVD that cracks somewhere in this retina, that internally limiting membrane, and those cells have leaked out, and you can see the dynamics of what that scar tissue is doing. And we can see here on this, the, the foveal pit is lost. You have traction from the uh, epiretinal membrane. We have epiretinal membrane here now. This is the internally limiting membrane here. This is the uh, epiretinal membrane. You know, don't, for, don't, don't forget that aqueous, about one or two percent drains through the back of the eye. So when you do a vitrectomy, someone goes for a vitrectomy, they take out the vitreous, they put balanced salt solution in. Does that balanced salt solution stay in there for the rest of the life? The answer is no. Uh, what happens is that rinses out. Now the posterior chamber and the anterior chamber is just all aqueous. So this isn't like an air fluid spot. This is the internal limiting membrane. This is epiretinal. That's probably aqueous sitting in that little black spot, that little area right there. Uh, is the dax black spot, circular spot, a weiss ring? Yes, this right here is a weiss ring. Looks like it pulled away here. This is the PVD. PVD. Thank you, Veronica. All right. So I'll have to see if I can find this. Um, I just thought about it whenever uh, it's it's in my laptop somewhere. If someone, I mean, you could Google it and find it. That's all I did. I would really encourage you to get this paper and read it. It's not that bad of a read. Um, I forget how many pages. It might be 10, 12 pages. But this is a pretty cool read here. The International Vitreo macular traction study group classification of vitreo macular adhesion traction and macular hole. And it came out in about 2013. And I grew up in the old, you know, kind of graduated in 1995. And you know, we really didn't call them adhesions and tractions and full thickness macular holes. And, you know, we used to have stage one and now they're full thickness with traction, without traction. I was like, what are where did this terminology change? And it really comes from this group here. And so some of the older retinologists, they kind of use the old nomenclature and the new retinologists are using this nomenclature. And it basically comes from this paper. So I would encourage you to find this paper, but look who, it, uh, look who the lead author is, okay? Jay Duker, right? Anytime you see that name, I love reading his stuff um, because he's one of the kind of the creators of OCT, understanding like OCT technology, starting off with that time domain, moving into that spatial domain. Uh, so, you know, it's a good paper to read if you kind of want to take this lecture tonight and kind of cement it in. So in hey, this Greg, paper, yes, Joe. I'm sorry, there, there was a question that came in. Sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 it's, that's what this is about. Sharon's asking, is there not enough of a difference in the index of refraction between aqueous and vitreous to you know, change a patient's Rx to the posterior chamber fills up with uh, AH, aqueous humor. So is there not enough, uh, not enough, yeah, index or refraction? So taking out the vitreous and replacing it with, uh, with yeah, I think that's a great question. Yeah, I, th I think the, we answered it. I think the answer is no, or there's really no shape to it to really change it. Um, so the vitreous is kind of, refractive neutral uh, neut uh, neutral right so the lens the 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 crystalline lens right it's curved and it has an index i guess maybe you could say maybe the anterior surface of the vitreous is curved but then the posterior surface is curved so i would say that 
you know, the vitreous is really, you know, if you do a vitrectomy in a sense, it's refractive neutral. So yeah, changing the vitreous to aqueous um, is based on probably the shape is refractive neutral, but never thought of it. And I love these things. I think that way, Joe, thoughts? Mm -hmm. I, I I don't think I, I could add anything that you have you haven't just said. I, I don't really have any thoughts on it, Greg. Yeah, I know that uh, you know when they do you know like a vitrectomy and they put silicone oil in, um, they don't become super hyperopic or myopic. So that vitreous cavity must be in a sense refractive neutral. That's that's out there. So, but obviously we know if you take the lens out, what happens? Uh, but it's probably because of the curves. All right. So great question. Thanks. Keep them rolling in. That's the synchronous and live and interaction being able to ask the speakers. Greg, right. I'm going to, I'm going to throw, I'm, I'm going to ask you if we're going to cover this later. Um, any, anything we want to talk about in terms of uh, treating floaters? Is that anything you want to talk about or is that in the lecture a little bit later? It, it's, it's not in the lecture. So, you know, we, we, we brought it up. So if you want, uh, you know, if you want to talk about it now, go right ahead. So. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of quite, you know, kind of curious what you, what your thoughts are about laser floater lysis and, uh, and vitrectomy for floaters. Yeah. So in Pennsylvania here, I mean, I know in Florida where this lysis is coming from, because, you know, obviously, you know, I love that state. I'm down a lot and looking forward to coming and coming to your house, Joe, this Thursday and hanging out for four or five days. And when I'm down there, you know, I see all the advertisements for if you got floaters, we can laser them. I don't know if there's anyone even in Pittsburgh, all the way over to Philadelphia, you know, New York to Baltimore that I know of anyone that's in a sense lasering them away. So I don't really have any comment on it because I really haven't seen it um, that's out there. Now for vitrectomies, you know, I usually tell the patient, I say, look, um, if you're drinking a, you know, a, a fifth of Jack Daniels, you know, you're on Xanax, you know, nervous, so on and so forth, driving you crazy is my point. I can send you to the retinologist and they'll consider doing a vitrectomy on you. Kind of the drawback is when you remove the vitreous, you're always going to get a cataract. No big deal if they're pseudophagic. Bigger deal if they... Um, are, you know, still 2020 and bothered by fo floaters, you know, 48 year old higher myopes can get the floater and drive them crazy. Um, but, you know, it is 90% of the volume of the eye. So I have seen it done, uh, you know, maybe once every other year in my area doing a vitrectomy, but they are going to form a cataract and then you're gonna, they're going to have to go through a secondary surgery. Now, if they're pseudophagic, maybe there's a little bit of a of a of a of a um um a little higher you know the higher chance that it will get done but mm -hmm. i can't really comment on the laser if you want to do that well there we, we we don't do it in our practice we don't have the laser i don't know that we we would get it uh, if we if, if it was well thought of i think people we would be doing it in our practice uh, there is a person a little further south of me who does it. Uh, I wrote something about this several years ago. He came across it. Um, we we had some discussions. He's very enthusiastic about it. Really, really builds his career. Has billboards about it. Uh, it, it, it. It's a little kooky to me. You know, laser lasers are perfectly safe. And, you know, until you have your first complication. You know, they don't remove anything. They don't, they only break it up. Uh, if, if the laser too close to the retina, you can end up with a detachment. Uh, I have had a patient for the last couple of weeks who had a vitrectomy for floaters done elsewhere. He was really happy about it. I had a patient this past week who was really interested in it. I actually had to reach out to our retinal specialist to see if he would do it. He agrees, you know, that he will he will do a vitrectomy occasionally. Uh, I had no, I had a patient probably within the last uh, year or so, really really bad floaters. I mean it it was bad. I I I I felt it was appropriate. I referred him to uh, one of the retinal surgeons who was working with us at the time, and uh, he uh, he talked him out of it. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, yeah, it's not great to take that vitreous out. That vitreous does have antioxidant uh, protective properties. 
And again, that's one of the reasons why they form a cataract, uh, really not from the surgery, that that uh, antioxidant uh, barrier protect the property, and then they form the cataract, usually a PSC or a you know, nice dense nuclear cataract. Um, another thing that brought up is kind of a thought is, you know, I teach this to the students that come through at the clinic uh, whenever I get a student, is that, you know, why do people see more floaters, since we're talking floaters after cataract surgery, than before, right? So they had the floaters there, maybe they had them there, before the cataract got dense. So a lot of people think it's like, oh, you took the cataract out and now you're getting more light. And that's probably maybe say, I don't know, the Caldwell rule is going to be say 10% and, uh, of it. And as Joe always says, 30% of the statistics are made up on the spot, right? So, but why do they see it? And, you know, more floaters. And I think the main reason is if you remember, you know, those basic drawings that we have the tree, and then it shines on the retina upside down. So this light comes down and this one comes up and the tree's upside down. Where that lines come together, that's a focal point. And the focal point in a, in a naturally phacic eye, not a pseudo phacic eye, is right behind the crystalline lens. And what happens in a pseudo phacic eye gets pushed back deeper, closer to the retina. And that's why people with asteroid high low cyst, like they never saw them before. And after cataract surgery, you got to warn them that they might see their floaters because the focal point gets pushed back a little bit. So kind of really the scientific reason, you know, why they see floaters more after cataract surgery is that focal point of the, it changes because of the implant gets pushed back a little bit further and probably a little bit is because there's better light going in there. So more light change in focal point. And that's again, why people with, after cataract surgery, could see their asteroid hylosis. All right. Anything else rolling in here, Joe, that I saw some questions pop up or do I? Uh, I just no, comment that somebody, somebody had a relative who uh, who actually had a vitrectomy for this uh, very recently is doing very well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the patients I've sent, they've done well with it, but they just, the surgeon, like you said, Joe, is just going to kind of try and talk them out of it nine, nine and a half times out of 10. So. All right, if we're caught up, let's jump back in here. So again, we're talking about this International Vitreo Macular Traction Study Group. Um, and then some of these things that came out, it says vitreo macular adhesion is defined as a perifoveal vitreous separation, uh, unperturbed uh, foveal morpholo um, uh, morphological features. So vitreo macular adhesion, basically you're seeing it separate and the anatomy is fine. And then vitreo macular traction is characterized by the anonymous vitreo, uh, posterior vitreo detachment accompanied by basically anatomical distortions. And that could be anything. It could, it could be distortion of the fovea. It can be a pseudocyst. It could be a macular schesis, pseudomacular edema, subretinal fluid. And then they define them as focal or broad. In clinic, I really never really found a useful, whether it's broad or if it's focal, if I'm going to follow one closer than the other, but they are defined as focal or broad based upon the size of the, of the vitreo macular traction. I kind of look again at the anatomy. Is it separating? Is, are the photoreceptors, is the RPE being involved? That will start to dictate kind of those spidey senses of when I want to follow the patient maybe a little bit closer. So you can, again, this is a nice read. You can go in, it talks about vitreo macular adhesion. Basically, we saw one earlier, vitreo macular traction. We're starting to get distortions and complications to the retina. And we can call them focal if they're less than 1500. Pretty much all the ones I see all day long are pretty much focal. Um, I rarely see a broad, but again, if I did, would it cause me to change my follow-up any different? Mm, probably not as a clinical finding. So again, vitreo macular adhesion, equivalent to a stage one PVD. Most eyes, again, when we're born, we have a complete vitreo macular adhesion at birth. And then as it lifts, we kind of see it based on the OCT lifting. So we can call it a vitreo macular adhesion. And again, we have vitreo macular tractions um, that are out there and it's based on the size. So like this one here, this is a nice vitreo macular traction. 
Um, this right here is smaller than 1500. So this would be a focal, right? Focal. How do we know that? The optic nerve is generally 1500 microns. I mean, there's some macro disc and there's some micro discs. Um, I don't care how small this nerve is. You can see that this little area right here going straight across, whoop, going straight across is smaller than this optic nerve. So that's going to be a focal vitreomacular traction. I just thought this was just a really, really cool picture. You can kind of see uh, how this kind of vitreous traction is still on, kind of that cineresis. You have the gel up here, just a really cool picture. You can see it's still attached here at the optic nerve. So we know that the uh, vitreous is attached in three places, really snug down in a sense in a non-diabetic patient is around the optic nerve. One, two, you can see optic nerve, optic nerve, the foveal area and out at the vitreous base. And you can probably, if we could get this out wide enough with some of these images that are coming out there at the vitreous base, fovea and optic nerve. So you can see at least two of them here in this picture. All right, let's talk about Donna here. Donna is in, she's a 63 year old woman. She wants a second opinion in the practice uh, on her nerve fiber layer. So this patient was referred to me by one of my colleagues in the practice. He's just, he's looking at this. He's like, it's normal tension glaucoma. She's had this funny kind of dropout. It's never really progressed. Um, things are changing. Greg, can you just, you know, I'm gonna put it on your schedule. Um, just look at it from 2011 for the last, you know, 11 years, pressures have been 14 to 18. That's where this normal tension comes in. I think she has some type of optic neuropathy. This might be something for Joda as he looks at, might give us some clues about what's going on. But it's just, let's take a look to see what this vitreous can potentially do. So you know, we've probably got this instrument in probably 2017 and 18. So we had some other photos before. Now we can track them. But you can see the, the glaucoma suspicion. That's kind of this arcuate defect. Uh, coming out of maybe this kind of you know, inferior area mm -hmm. down here, kind of looks like a glaucomatous defect. But if you look over the last however many years, this is 2018 to 2022, been pretty stable. And when I'm looking at glaucoma progression analysis, I usually put a little bit, if I'm tilting one way or the other, a little bit more weight in the ganglion cell for those that are out there. Reason being, when you do the ganglion cell, it's measuring the macula. So the technician says, hey, look right at the light. You see my light in there, whatever color it is, green, red, look right at it. That's easy. To get the nerve fiber layer, they have to move their eye over nasally. They say, look inside the instrument, look over, you see that? And maybe they're moving their eye a little bit while they're looking nasal. So they might get a little bit of some, maybe some wiggle in there. So whenever I'm looking at progression analysis, I like to put a little bit more weight in the ganglion cell because it's a little, they're able to fixate with their macula where they have to look nasal with each eye to get that optic nerve so they can scan around the optic nerve. So you can see here that maybe this was a little higher, this a little bit lower, but these scans here have been pretty stable. Then over here, we got this drop. And it looks like right here, look, you got some yellow, you got some yellow, and then a big drop and maybe a little change here. Um, so it's starting to flag it statistically. Hey, it's a little bit quicker than average, flagging it a little bit here. So, you know, that's what sparked. Is there progression going on? And you can see that these are flattened here. We're missing our t snits is it an optic neuropathy? Is it an old trauma? Is it some neurodegenerative disease that's out there? Is it the number one optic neuropathy glaucoma? Is it normal tension? I don't know. Let's see. So what I'm looking at here is I'm going to go to this one first. Oh, I'm going to go to this one first. When I looked at the scan, I saw that in 2018 that this vitreomacular adhesion or maybe it's vitreomacular traction is pulling on the macula. So from this scan here, what did, what's changed? Look, it released. 
right? So did that change the nerve fiber layer? Did this, was this pulling this this way, making this less yellow? And then when this released, because we're talking microns, right? We're talking 84 microns to looks like 78 microns on average. And the, when that releases, did that create that change? So that almost like, oh my gosh, look, they're progressing. Well, what's progressing? Is it ganglion cell body loss? Or is it this here that has released and allowed that retina to kind of go back to where it was? So when I saw that, I decided, well, let's start looking around the optic nerve. And you could see here this black ring allows us to, you know, this is where it's capturing this black line right here, right? The T-SNP values. And we can see here, when I was looking, I said, look, there's traction around this optic nerve. Let's take a look and see what happened whenever we open this up. And so I tried getting the same scans here and trying to get in here and measure. So I tried going in here and drawing the cap, you know, draw the capillaries in that the line, this is 91 microns trying to get the same anatomical area here. And we go from 108 down to 100. We went from 91 down to you know, 86. So we, we went down. So it looks like this is breaking here. We're getting some, again, that vitreous is dynamic, right? That's why I wanted to kind of focus on tonight. So are these now progressing changes that we're seeing here, and especially in this left eye, is it really retina changes or is it the vitreo retinal changes? Joe, it looks like you were gonna have a comment. Was there something that you wanted to mention? Now, there, there are a number of things I wanna mention here. If you'll go back to the, the imaging that you, you just had, what this one? Uh, yeah, that that looks that that's really that's really outstanding. It looks like you know these are what we call segmentation errors. Uh, the machine does get a little confused, and that's why you really have to, in, in some cases, delve into it, and and really think kind of like you like you are right here outside the box, and not just looking at that linear regression line. Not looking at the uh, at the at the numbers that are are being presented in isolation, but also, as you said, your you, your first clue was looking at that B scan. That one B scan looked different from a, the other B scan. There is that one. Yeah, I mean the the uh, the uh, yeah. You can see that you know there's there's clear you know. There, 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 are, there are differences in there, and picking up on that, I think that's uh, that's really pretty critical, and that is really very, very high level of interpretation. I don't know everybody would pick up on that, to be honest with you, Greg. It, it, it's almost uh, a little scary that you, you can you can be led down the primrose bro, primrose path and misdiagnosis thing is getting worse. But I I guess it's better to overcall progression than undercall progression. Yeah, and I, this this lady's going back to being a normal tension glaucoma suspect mm -hmm. and not even on any treatment. Um, I just have a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, got, I have a question. Do you have visual fields to go along with it? Because, you know, this is this is all the crucial aspect of putting everything together. Yeah, and uh, we do. Um, I think they were pretty clean. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't really pull it on Friday when I was building this lecture. I had her name written down because... Uh, you know, at, at some point I wanted to kind of build this vitreo retina lecture. Mm -hmm. um, and this was just one of the cases that, that I had written down, but I didn't pull the visual fields. But that means a good point that mm -hmm. and anytime you give the lecture the first time, I'll go back and scan those. But it was pretty clean. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. you know, maybe, a, maybe a nasal defect, superior nasal defect, and mm -hmm. maybe something here, but nothing that's really progressed over the years either. So. so really for everybody out there listening to this, I, I think it, I think it's a great lesson uh, to underscore that what may be obvious may, you know, may not really actually be happening. And, you know, we have to look at this in, total, in totalitarian uh, measures and the machine only can 
do certain things and it gets confused sometimes. That's why nothing will supplant your clinical acumen as, as Greg is showing here. And, and so what we're seeing on, oh, let me go back here. What we saw here was this, this is around the optic nerve, right? This is, this is this line, these pictures here is this line right here mm -hmm. is what we're looking at. And when we go to the macula here and we're seeing this, I couldn't get my camera to take the one I wanted, but these are the same kind of levels as what we're looking for. But you can see we have the vitro where we might say vitro macular adhesion. But now I would maybe change that to maybe vitro macular traction because mm -hmm. if we could measure this whole retina in microns, the, the microns might have changed. So now we're really getting down into splitting hairs. Is this vitro macular adhesion or vitro macular traction? Remember, traction is there's changes. There's probably enough tra traction here to cause a change. And then it released, it caused that. And it really mm -hmm. wasn't lost to ganglion cells. And as Joe mentioned, what'd you say, Joe, like a segmentation error? Um, it's segmented looks like okay it's just that it's thicker just because it's being pulled on right mm -hmm. so, so kind of a you know just some just food for thought i wanted to kind of dive into rather kind of a different lecture tonight than that's out there with oct so you know is there progression where it's just kind of if you look right here to here this has been pretty stable right it's getting this downhill trend because of this and if you look, it looks like there was probably some type of release of that of that vitromacular traction, probably in this area, and maybe some more release over time. And I think that's why you had this traction here, the release, and now this is pretty stable. So if I would cut these out, this, this progression analysis might not be flagged anymore. And the same thing here could be because if you look at this spot and this spot and this spot, now if I would take my ruler and draw across, now we're going pretty flat. Um, so, and yeah, and a patient can have more diseases at one. Again, I, there's, I think there's some type of neuropathy, retinopathy going on, some old traumas or some neurogenic disease that we haven't been able to identify yet. But uh you know, I, I did not start this patient on glaucoma drops, even though one, two, this one, two, and three are showing potentially progression. But I think the progression is due to the vitreous in this patient changing these scans. So. And I think that would take some uh, pretty fancy record keeping <laughs> to, uh, you know, to really explain what's going on there. But I agree. I, would, I don't think I'd make uh, an intervention without a change in the visual field. Fields are good. All As right. I said, the, these are not Silicon Valley rumple still skins we put in strong get out gold. Yeah, yeah, good point. Good point. 75 year old man. This is Edward. Cataract check, epiretinal membrane check, visual acuity is 2020, 2030. Got some cataracts. It's an OCT course. Let's take a look. So, which way am I going here? Hold on. There we go. So, let's take a look. Let's go back. 75 year old man, Edward. Cataract, epiretinal membrane check, cataracts, corrected to 2020, 2030. Okay, what's going on with that 2030 eye? And what I want to look at here is you could see the distortion. See how smooth this one is and distorted here, kind of kind of lumpy and bumpy, right? And you can see an epiretinal membrane here, maybe some fluid here. Look how this drops off. Boom, straight down and across. So he's got bilateral epiretinal <laughs> membranes. But if we look at the photoreceptors, the photoreceptors are pretty well intact. So, and so use the chat box here. We're going to use the chat box. You guys are still awake out there. Um, what would you call this? Is this an epiretinal membrane? Is this vitreomacular traction? This does have a name to it. What would you call this here? Use the chat box. Perry, it says, great discussion of stuff that drives me nuts daily. Absolutely. Yeah, same thing here when you're trying to interpret these. So, all right. Anyone have any diagnosis here? What do you want to call this thing? No one's rolling in with the, into the chat box. Yeah, there we go. I see them now. 
uh, PVD, epiretinal membrane. Yeah, I wouldn't call it AMD yet, but uh, we'll we'll get out through there. Traction, vitreo macular traction. All right, let me show you this here. Baby epiretinal membrane, love it. Pseudo hole, I love it. That's good. Adhesion, no VMT. I agree. Good job. All right, I'm going to go with the pseudo holes, and I love that baby epiretinal membrane. Um, and then that's pretty what we'd call it a pseudo hole. You know, a pseudo hole is no loss of foveal tissue as observed in a lamellar or full thickness macular hole. Invaginated or heaped foveal edges, concomitant epiretinal membrane, steep macular contour. That's what this was right here. That's that steep macular contour. It goes boom, straight down. Steep macular contour. Uh, no loss of retinal tissue. So again, those that are out there, I see pseudo hole, question mark, pseudo hole, no VMT, I agree. This would be considered, you know, pseudo holes that are out there. So, but the key is it all depends on what cut you're scrolling through, right? So we were just looking at these two cuts here, 11 and 12 on this right eye. So when we go and we look at, here's 11 and 12 again, uh, of the left eye, sorry, that was right eye, now we're in the left eye. Now we got, I would say here, an epiretinal membrane. We've got a pseudo hole here. Over here, now we have an epiretinal membrane, but now look where this separation is. This separation, again, is where the photoreceptors are, the outer nuclear layer, the plexiform layer. Now we're starting to get this split. And this would be one of the early lamellar holes. But notice how the photoreceptors are intact. So this is not a full thickness. So when you look at this one here, I put this one here as being a pseudo hole. And this one here is a lamellar hole. And when you read that paper, it goes through and it tells you it's a partial thickness foveal defect, uh, an irregular foveal contour, a defect in the inner fovea, not having actual loss of tissue, but the intraretinal splitting, the schesis, typically between the outer plexiform layer, boom, right there, uh, and the outer nuclear layer. Maintenance of the intact photoreceptor, okay? So it depends. Up here on this cut, number 11 is a pseudo hole. Move down here to 12, we got a pseudo epiretinal membrane, pseudo hole with a lamellar hole. So again, it all depends on which one we're looking at. And then look here, you almost got like contraction of the foveal pit with this macula schesis. And then down here, you can call it a cyst. You know, again, where's the separation? Remember I, earlier, so I want to go through the anatomy, that loose association, you have traction right here. There's enough tractional forces that it's pulling up and it's starting to separate with that inner retina and outer retina between that plexiform layer and nuclear layer that's out there. So here's a 72-year-old woman, diabetic, cataract, and we're following up on XXX. I'm not giving you the, I've been following this lady for the last few years. It's an OCT course. So as I click through the images, Place your thoughts. It's a little tricky. It might not be related to the vitreous, but this has been really popping up and we're starting to get some pretty cool understanding of this condition, or at least we're going to get more understanding with one of the docs. So pay attention and uh, put your answer in the chat box as we get there. Oops, wrong way. My mouse is being goofy here. So this is just an OCT image. We're looking at the superficial retina. Not really much going on here. Here's another image. And now we can see that we kind of have a loss of the, ep of the ellipsoid zone, starting to get some photoreceptor damage. We can see there's some atrophy. We have this kind of come crashing down. Um, the inner retina looks to be intact, but the outer retina is what's compromised in this scan. So before we were a little bit here, now we're here, now we're gonna change. Ugh, hold on, there we go. Now we got this space. 
And we got this cyst here. Now we have, no, now we got the inner retina involved. And now we got the outer retina, but look, mitochondria, 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 gone. Mitochondria gone, you can kind of see it drop out here. Got this big space, got this area here, but we still have this intact, which is important to this diagnosis, this intact kind of internal limiting memory. Not kind of, it is the internal limiting memory. Cutting through even more. Bovial schesis, bullseye, retinopathy, Plaquenil, MACTEL. MACTEL. Okay, that was the right eye. Now look right here, see these? This here is important on this kind of, this on foss and the deeper retina, these kind of spaces. We're gonna move to the left eye. So it's bilateral, got this area here. Now we kind of got the inner retina involved. This up to this point looks pretty intact. Now we're starting to get those mitochondria in the photoreceptor area involved. Inner retina, intact, internal limiting membrane, starting to now affect the outer retina. You guys have got it. Most of you guys have got it. I see guys and gals. I see it rolling in. Here's another scan. Inner retina, outer retina, this kind of cavitation. This is what's bad. See how the mitochondria of the photoreceptors, this is now where the vision loss is going to start to occur. This doesn't really cause the vision loss, right? Those bipolar cells, those amacrin cells, those cells that are in the inner, it's when the outer photoreceptors start to, start to go. So let's see the chat box and the guys that said retinal telangiectasia, MACTEL, you guys are all over it. So that's what that is. And we're seeing this more and more now that we have kind of these these spectral domain types of, uh, of scans that are out there. And this is what I wanted to show you. Um, I have followed this young lady for quite a few years. We can see here, this was 2018. This was the last scan, looks like April, looks like she'll be coming in in 2023 to get her scan. I saw her here. Um, she comes in pretty much yearly, not much we can do yet, which is kind of neat, um, unless Paul Bernstein comes up with something, which is what I'm gonna talk about. Um, but I'll go scan through here. You can kind of see how this, th this condition has changed over the, the years from 2018 to 2022, this, macular you know, telangiectasia, retinal telangiectasia. This is all right eye. But you can see, look at the acuity in 2018. It's probably pretty good, pretty decent still. It's going to be affected, but look what happened here. Photoreceptor destruction. This was a bad year. You know, the transition from 2020 to 2022 we probably have some scans. I probably didn't put them in here to kind of keep the images big, but we would have all the images, maybe all the six or seven images. But this would be now the macula of acuity, right? Here, the photoreceptor or the uh, mitochondria line is intact. The photoreceptors are intact. It's more inner retina disease. Now it's outer retina disease. And then you can see here, this is just another scan. Here is the left eye progression over time, cutting through here, going through here and here. So again, the, it's usually bilateral, at least the, uh, the type two is bilateral. You, good news is it's asymmetric. And you can see here now the acuity is probably gonna start to drop a little bit more because the photoreceptors are involved the mitochondria line is starting to become, is starting to die off. And as mitochondria <laughs> die off, you don't have the ATP to kind of drive the drive the vision. So, you know, what do you think the acuity is? It's probably going to be worse in the right eye than it is in the left eye, at least in 2022. 
And here is just a screenshot going back to, 12, to 2012, 2025, 2030, 2040, 2025, 2060. This is probably a bad acuity that day, 2030, 2040. But as we go up, look what starts to happen, 70s, 80s. And then these last three years or three measurements, she's been 2,400. Over here in this eye, 2020, and we're down to 2030. So 2,400 and 2030, which kind of matches this area here. This is her fovea, right? And uh, the epiretinal or the uh, epiretinal membrane, the photoreceptors are gone. We still have intact photoreceptors right here. So that's why that kind of reflects these acuities worse in the right eye than the left eye. This young lady, Tammy, she's in for her computer glasses for her retinal telangiectasia. Okay, it's an OCT course. Let's take a look. We know it's telangiectasia. You can see how it's affecting here in this scan, the outer retina. I don't think that's bad enough yet to really cause any acuity, but you can kind of see what's happening here. Um, you can see here, again, this is kind of like a, a pathognomonic for retinal telangiectasia where this, kind of, it's more of a sinkhole type. I kind of think of it as a sinkhole in my head where the, where the, gra where the epi or the internal ligament membrane remains intact and the retinal vessels are starting to, that macula area, that foveal pigment, that issue. Um, but you can see here as we go across the intact mitochondria, this is oxidative stress. This is, you're able to see it. The mitochondria are, are being stressed out here, so stressed that there's just atrophy, the photoreceptors have atrophied away, and the inner retina now is filling in here in this scan. And then we're just kind of cutting through here, uh, and there's the next scan. And then, let's see, that's the right eye. Now we're migrating over to the left eye. And so we come across and look at the left eye. This all looks pretty good in this kind of foveal area, foveal pit. But in this cut, you can see here, this isn't poor acquisition. See, this is stress right here. When these start to fade like this, this isn't a bad scan. This is your photoreceptors under stress. They're dying. There's not enough mitochondria. Remember, we talked about there's 500 mitochondria in that in those individual photoreceptors, they're starting to die off. And so the signal, when it reflects, if there's no mitochondria, it's not poor signal, that's showing you that there's stress going on. And enough stress here that the, the photoreceptor just died, and now the inner retina just collapsed down in there. And then this is uh, more of the left eye, now you're starting to see kind of that cavitation that starts to occur uh, in retinal telangiectasia. So, you know, what was her acuities here is that you could see in the right eye, 2030, 2030, 2040, 2030. Over here, 2030, 25, 2040. So they're about equal. Luckily, if both eyes open, you know, she could still see 2030. She just needs some computer glasses, kind of like a little bit of low vision to help her while she's on the computer to see um, for her. So, uh, you know, 2030, which kind of matches what's going on here. The maculas, the, the cones are under stress, but it's not a 2400 like we saw in that other, in that other example. So what's really cool, uh, if you really want to know, if you want to ever want to read or listen to some YouTubes or the Ocular Wellness and Nutritional Society. They have Dr. Bernstein. He's an MD, PhD, uh, really spent his life in the macular area studying macular pigment. He's found out these binding proteins, so on and so forth. And he's now starting a macular telangiectasia type two. Um, it's a it's a it's a genetic disease. He's trying to figure out the penetrance and the chromosomes involved, and then. He, again, is really into nutrition of the retina, and he's trying to figure out if there's something nutritional that can go on. He's really found some changes in that area that's out there. And, you know, he goes through and he's doing a study, and you can see that these pictures kind of look like, and he studies the macular pigment and seeing the scarring going on and the prevalence. So it's some really cool uh, research that's being done in this area. 
uh, that's out there. He feels that uh, there's probably at some point some nutritional value uh, for these patients. Stay tuned. Uh, that's out there. He's really looking at the inherited retinal disorder. And it was really found, like when I listened to his, this was about six months ago, he found a whole family and he was able to kind of track how it all kind of found out. And that's how they found this inherited retinal disorder. So macular telangiectasia kind of runs in families and they're really trying to, to figure out what to, what to do with this. So he's started this uh, um, this, I guess, this this uh, registry is the word I'm looking for um, and trying to track uh, this. So it's going to be really cool that's out there. So, you know, God bless people like, you know, Paul Bernstein that's kind of lived his life in this area and tracking these and doing these types of things that's out there. And that's why I like scanning these people and putting them on, you know, a full supplement that's out there. You're going to hear me over the years just kind of really hammering you know, that that retina, it is a, a uh, it's staring at light all day long. So I like using formulas that are comprehensive that are out there because the eye really, really deserves it. And that's one of the things I'll be folding into a lot of my lectures as we go forward, because we could probably do a lot of things with nutrition. I was watching a commercial the other day, they were talking about, hey, how do you, you know, you do your dogs die early. What do you do? Feed them well. And they were showing images of these dogs that were 18 years old and 20 years old and 24 years old. And what did they do? They fed them properly, uh, changed their nutrition. So we could probably learn a lot with nutrition. So, but this is not a nutrition talk. All right. So now back to uh, another patient here. This is a 58 year old woman, Barbara, new patient, no changes since last visit. Uh, she was here one year ago. Oh, I thought this was just a really cool case. She has a history of mantle cell lymphoma. She's having chemotherapy every month. I thought this was really, really cool because she was seeing another doc a year ago and maybe things changed, but when she came in, this is what her retinas look like. So she has mantle cell lymphoma. She's getting chemotherapy. And these are cotton wool spots here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Lots of cotton wool spots, more than nine. Over here, lots of cotton wool spots and a vitreous hemorrhage right here. This is a pretty ischemic retina. Cotton wool spots, even if it's just one, you know, I would work the patient up because a cotton wool spot is a sign of uh, ischemia. So I, I mentioned to her that it was either like radiation retinopathy versus diabetic retinopathy or a combination of both. Um, so I just took a really quick angiogram of her and I thought this was you know, neat from an academic standpoint. You could see the dropout. You could see the ischemia that's going on in this retina. You could see here that the, uh, that the, uh, uh, the eye is not really well perfused in this area. And the short of the story is same thing happened to the other eye. You could see the left eye. You could see some of the kind of the cotton wool or exudate or blood that's in the retina, the hyperfluoresces, you can't tell in an OCT. But you can see the dropout that's occurring. You can see the nice blood flow, the RPE, but you can see the minimal amount of blood flow that's in this inner retina. And she had PRP done. She's getting VEGF injections. And uh, the retinologist said, things are going well. I like to follow my patients. And you can see this one right here. This was just came in the other day on uh, February 20th of 2023. She was just in. She said everything was going well. I saw her back here in, a, in, in November 21. There's been some other visits in between. Uh, but what I want to point out is had a little bit of cystic changes here. We got her back to the retinologist. Um, you know, they had her down to like every six months. I like to follow these patients academically, and we were able to get her in to see the retinologist because she's having a lot of cystic changes going on here. You can see this was pretty good. Um, so despite, this is what she looked like just the other day on the 20th of February. Doesn't look too bad when you look at her with an OCT. Again, look where the separation is. It's between that inner and outer retina. 
Um, I don't think it's traction. I think she's got fluid in here uh, that needs to be addressed. All right. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly here because I see we're getting close uh, to the time that we need to land this, but it goes back to understanding the anatomy. Um, I'm going to go through this quickly here. She basically has a vitreous hemorrhage. She sees a line in her vision. And what I did on this case here is I just imaged her, her uh, vitreous hemorrhage and her PVD creating the vitreous hemorrhage with the OCT. <clears throat> what I want to kind of show you is this one here is kind of knowing the anatomy. This is a 71-year-old woman. It's Elizabeth. She had an aortic valve replacement on the 26th. <clears throat> she had blurry vision since her surgery, and she was told she had dry eye, and she was using Refresh Reliva. Well, when she came in and got her OCT scan, remember, this is the inner retina. This is where the blood vessels are. Right eye is doing well. The left eye looks well on this side, on the nasal side, but all of a sudden just kind of drops off. But the outer retina is intact. What is in the inner retina? The capillaries that we showed at when we do angiography. So here it is here, just another opening it up and examining. Mm -hmm. You could see how beautiful this looks, but the inner retina is just missing. And what's in this inner retina? the capillaries. So remember, it's the capillaries that are in the inner retina. So now do you see the embolus? It's right there. There's the embolus. It's still there. It's probably calcium. She had an aortic valve removed. She probably broke off some calcium and it plugged this up through here. And that's why she's missing part of her retina. Same thing happened with Connie here, superior sudden vision loss to the superior vision of the right eye. And when you look, look at the changes to the ganglion cell, we can see the retina is thin. This didn't, this is a segmentation error that Joe shows. That should be here. We can go and change it, but that's not going to really change much. She's having a tough time fixating because the retina is thinned here. The outer retina is intact. That tells me I got to think of things that can happen to the inner retina. And the inner retina has the blood vessels. So when we went and looked and did the angiogram, definitely see a capillary issue. We could see not so much blood flow here, good blood flow here. And whenever we took a look, didn't look too, too bad, but we learned to look really close. There's something right there. I'm going to blow it up for you. Something right there in that artery. And that's some type of embolus right there that's causing this area to be blocked off. So whether it's cholesterol, probably calcium, that is a branch retinal artery occlusion. So... That's where I thought I would end up. I just had some retinal pearls down through here. We saw that image earlier. Um, we didn't really get to talk about the full thickness macular holes, but I wanted to really talk about the vitreous and the retina and how that can be. Um, I put the other slides in because the first time I'm doing it. Um, so I didn't know where I would be, but we can maybe come back and finish up macular holes sometime. So I'm just gonna fast forward here. So I can get to the last few slides. Joe, anything rolling in regarding questions? It appears not, uh, Greg. I, I think that you've shown some very impressive uh, images, great image capture, a lot of good uh, analysis. No, I, I think everybody's just with us. Okay, great. So, you know, again, I wanted to focus tonight on vitreoretinal in interpretation um, a lot of the times when I get these images sent to me, you know, which is great, a lot of it is this, pseudo holes, lamellar holes, adhesions, tractions, and, you know, what to do with it. A lot of times it's just follow because um, they're not going to go in and do membrane peels. So with that, I see, you know, some nice things rolling in here. You're very welcome. Um, it looks like all the questions have been answered. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say thank you for attending tonight. Um, this was OCT interpretation, vitreous and retina, enough pearls to make a necklace.